Hi, my name is Tabitha Kelly and I am submitting my book talk video to you today. I want to talk about the book that I chose, which was Brian's Winter by Gary Paulson. Um, I chose this story actually because I remember reading it and I would believe I was in fifth grade. Uh, we read Hatchet as part of our curriculum and I wanted to know more about the story and my teacher had recommended uh, Brian's Winter. And so um, I did do Hatchet for my first project and then Brian's Winter for this one. So I wanted to go into a little bit more about this story and why it is an incredible recommendation. It is absolutely a 9 out of a 10 for me um, on the recommendation scale. So it's set in deep secluded Canadian woods um, from the start of fall until heavy winter. So a little background story in the very first book, you read about what happens to Brian. So Brian was a teenager. This is the main character in the story. And he was a teenager who was traveling back from his, he was traveling from his mother's house in New York. Um, his parents had just been divorced and he was traveling to his father's house who lives in Canada. Actually, his father's working in Canada. So that's where he's staying right now. And that's where he's headed. He was in a small little two passenger bush plane and in a ridiculous turn of events, the pilot ended up having a heart attack and dying in the plane. And right before this happened, he had allowed Brian to take on a little bit of the flying for a second and taught him a little bit about flying, which came in handy when he had um, passed away from a heart attack. So Brian ended up flying for a little bit until the fuel ran out and he crashed the plane into the middle of the woods, which is a circumstance that I can't even imagine for a teenage boy to go through. So this second story is actually an alternate ending. And Gary Paulson actually has a few different alternate endings for this story. People wanted to know more about Brian's story. At the end of Hatchet, something happens and, and it ends the story. And so people wanted to know more. So what they did was, what Gary did was he, or Paulson, I'm sorry, what he did was he created different alternate endings for the original hatchet story. And this is him surviving, Brian surviving winter. And so he goes through so many things that he has to try to pull, like his prior knowledge of, of documentaries that he watched, um, anything that he remembers learning in school to try to survive. And the only thing that he had in the first story was a hatchet. But at the end of the story, he ends up getting a survival kit that has a few other things that can help him, like a rifle and a, um, a a pot to cook in and things like that. Um, just a couple, a knife so that he can, you know, skin the animals that he hunts, things like that. Some things that he did not have prior to, um, finding that survival pack that was in the back of the plane. And that was a whole ordeal on the first book. So I highly recommend you reading that first before you move on to Brian's winter or any of the other ones. But the main theme between, uh, Brian's winter and any of the other of the stories about Brian. It's basically survival. It's man versus nature. It's perseverance through ridiculously hard times. Um, it is the genre of a young adult novel, an adventure, realistic fiction. That's Those are all things that could be easily classified for this book. So I want to read a selection and I tried to, to make it as small as I could, but this book is just packed with so much imagery and so many things that I, I really encourage you to read, especially if you're interested at all in this kind of survival thing. Another huge reason, and I'll go into this later, that I, I love this book is there's not a lot of dialogue. So he has to... You really get hit Brian's thought process. You have to give a lot of imagery. You have to still, if no one's talking, then you get nothing but images uh, throughout the book. So let me just read you a little bit. So background to what I'm about to read. It's um, chapter 9, page 76 to 79. I'm going to go a little bit over it, um, but it's just super important. This was now at the dead of winter. He's already started his preparation. We're in winter and he is, it's his very first winter alone. Uh, he is a teenage boy alone in the middle of the woods in Canada in the middle of winter. So he's trying to survive and he was out hunting and came upon the largest animal that he had ever seen in his whole life. So I'm just going to read you a little bit from that. Ah, he thought, there it is. Like it or not, I am about to hunt moose. His stomach tightened and he stood and quickly glanced at his position. The brush was too thick for him to run, even if he had wanted to. And the truth was, he didn't want to. He was different. He did have better weapons. And there was a lot of meat on a moose. 
No room, he thought, to maneuver or to shoot. He moved his head to the right, and all he could see was thick brush, then to the left, and it was not the same. No, there, a small opening, not four feet across and about four feet off the ground, almost a tunnel through the brush. But if it all worked right, all worked exactly right, he might be able to get a shot. He moved to the left and stood facing the opening, leaned the killing lance against a nearby bush, held the bow up with the top tipped slightly to the right to keep it out of the brush, and put his best arrow on the string ready to draw and waited. And waited. Time seemed to stop. Somewhere to his left he heard the soft sound of a bird's wings, then the scratchy sound of a chickadee. Bush cracked directly in front of him, but he could see nothing. Another bird flew past. He aged, waiting, and now he heard the moose stepping, its hooves shushing in the snow, and another breaking branch, and then a line, a curved line, as the side of the moose's font front end came into view in the tunnel. Brian tensed, his fingers tightening on the string. The edge of the shoulder moved slowly, ever so slowly, to the left, bringing more and more of the moose's chest into view. A third there, then a half, then two-thirds, and then the whole chest. Brian drew the shaft back. A cow, his brain registered. A large cow moose. No antlers. A little spit dripping from the side of her mouth. Brown eyes looking at him, but not seeing him or at least he hoped not. Twenty feet, no more. Six, seven paces at the most. He released the bowstring. He could see it all later in his mind's eye, so it all must have registered, but when he did it, it when, but when he did it, everything happened so fast, and yet incredibly slowly, that it all seemed one event. The arrow jumped from the string, and he saw the feathers fly straight away from him and at the moose, and slam into the moose's neck, just above the center of her chest, and in that instant, in the same split second, the moose caught the movement of the bow and arrow in Brian's head and charged. So fast she almost met the arrow. If Brian had expected the brush to slow her down or error the arrow striking her to handicap her, he was sadly mistaken. She was at him like a cat, so fast that she seemed to blur, and yet his mind took it all in. I hit her. The arrow hit her in the neck. She's charging. She's charging at me. Another arrow? No, no time. The lance. That's it, the lance. He threw the bow aside and reached for the lance, all in one motion and all too late. He felt his hand clamp on the shaft of the lance at the same time she came out of the brush on top of him. He had one fleeting image of a wall of brown hair, the feathers of the arrow sticking out of the middle, and he went down. He would never know what saved him. She was gigantic and on him, and he thought she would crush him, mash him to the ground. But either the bow, either the arrow hampered her movement, or the momentum carried her too far, and she went over Brian and had to turn and come back at him. He was hurt, his leg, his shoulder, yet he could move, and he rolled, still holding the killing lance, and came up to a kneeling position. He raised the head of the lance just as she hit him again. One image, she threw herself at him, her eyes red with rage, and he saw her run into the lance, the point entering her chest just below the arrow. Then her head hit his forehead. Brian saw one flash of white light, as bright as all the snow, then nothing but pain and darkness. And it goes into chapter 10. How much imagery was packed into that? You got his thought process, his very quick thought process, not even full sentences. You could feel the snow. You could like almost breathe in that cold air. You could almost see the the moose breathing and how he the moose didn't see him. And just every detail that Paulson puts into this book is incredible. I can't wait to read all of them because I've only read the first two. And now that I will have more time with this semester over, I, I want to read every one of them. He just provides such perfect imagery. Like you, that, that picture of, of a movie in your head is absolutely what you're going to get with this because there's, again, there's hardly any dialogue whatsoever. And so you get so much imagery. I could still see everything that this kid has was seeing around him. And I just, I can't, recommend this book enough um, be just because of all of the incredible imagery 
that he experiences. So um, my recommendation for this book is absolutely, it's a nine out of 10, 100% recommend it. Um, the audience would be middle school to adults. I think anybody middle school and up would absolutely enjoy this. Uh, the important uh, lesson for this that I would say, the takeaway, is the perseverance planning for the next step when you're trying to survive the current step. I apologize, I had to pause the video for a second. I have my kiddos with me. But my important lesson, back what I was saying, is perseverance planning for the next step while trying to survive in this current step. Students could absolutely relate to that. And I feel like it might not be surviving a winter alone in the woods, but everyone and even our youngest children go through so many trials that we don't even understand anymore because we're completely, you know, taken out of that situation or out of the the, the current um time of, of their lives because we're so much older or, or things like that. And so helping them understand that you can persevere through the hardest times to think outside of the box, to remember prior knowledge to help you get through any kind of problem solving real world or otherwise. Um, and those kinds of things, I think that would be a great recommendation for anyone middle school and above. Um, I just can't say enough great things about this book and I would recommend it to anyone that loves to read. I, I don't think there's a, a person who's ever read anything that wouldn't love this book. Um, I, yeah, I, it's the hatchet adventure is the series and I can't wait to read every single bit of Paul, um, of Gary Paulson's work. So thank you so much for listening to my book talk video. Um, and I hope that this inspires you to read more of his work. So thank you so much.